The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, a highly sustainable shareholder-driven cooperative that safely produces, processes, and markets sugar while being environmental stewards to ensure future opportunities for its shareholders, employees, and surrounding communities. Additional support by MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. And by Ask Me Council 5, a union of 43,000 members who advocate for excellence in public services, dignity in the workplace, and opportunity and prosperity for all working families. Live from St. Paul, we welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you can join us this evening for an hour-long conversation about the public policy issues that are facing Minnesota. We have, as always, a distinguished panel of guests, but we have some housekeeping matters we have to address before we get to those guests. I want to remind you that this is your program, hence the catchy name, Your Legislators, and we invite you to send your questions in to us via all the usual electronic means, uh, fax, uh, email, Facebook Live, uh, and probably several other things I neither remember nor understand. So you send those questions to us. We'll see that they get to the panel. I also want to welcome our viewers in the uh, Rosemount Farmington area who are joining us uh, via their cable network, and we're delighted to have them with us uh, in the weeks ahead. So now we turn to the first item of business each week, which is the introduction of that distinguished panel of guests. And I begin to my immediate left, a frequent guest with us. In fact, we have, uh, we have a veteran panel tonight. Everyone's been with us multiple times over the past several years, beginning with uh, Senator Scott Dibble from District 61 in Minneapolis. Senator Dibble, uh, we were just discussing the fact that uh, uh, you, you, your, your high school degree comes from my neighborhood down in the Apple Valley area. Yes. So, uh, uh, we're, but we're here to talk about your representation of District 61 in Minneapolis. Tell our viewers a little bit about your background in history and so forth. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks. Many of you serve on things like Great. that. Yeah. yeah. And happy to hear there are new viewers from mm -hmm. the Rosemount area. That's uh, right down right. the road. Yeah. From, right from down from Highway 42. So right. welcome to everyone from Rosemount. So I represent um, the southwest part of Minneapolis, a little bit of downtown, a little bit of south Minneapolis. I serve on the Transportation Committee. Uh, I serve on Senator Osmick's Energy Committee as well as the Environment Mm -hmm. uh, committee and um, been in this in the legislature for about 17 years. Served one term in the House. They call me House Trained. <laughs> we'll just start off in the House. Or the old joke uh, that Phyllis Kahn used to say: um, when a House member moves to the Senate, they raise the collective IQ of both bodies. <laughs> so uh, happy to be here. Work a lot on transportation issues. Uh, worked uh, previously. Uh, uh, for the City Council of Minneapolis and uh, worked at the neighborhood level and before that I was a corporate guy. Very good. Uh, also joining us, a uh, frequent guest from District 28A, Winona, Representative Gene Pulowski. Representative Pulowski, you and I had a chance to visit a little bit. Uh, yes, we did. About the capital renovation project. You want to promo your, your website a little bit because I was really fascinated by the, the material you brought to our little meeting. Well, over the last three years I've created a multimedia of the entire history of the restoration of the Capitol and I have to give Tom Olmscheid credit. He has given me a series of discs that are over 3,000 high-definition pictures from the very beginning of the restoration. I winnowed that down to 700, and then I started literally from the bottom of the Capitol, and I worked my way up to the ball and then out into the wings and on the stairs. So the, the beauty of it is because Tom went everywhere. 
-hmm. So you see what happened inside, which you will never see again. So a capital full of scaffolding. You'll see what happens when you have to take paintings down and literally put them back together. And this is all by hand. There's no cookie cutter here. And I, and I have to thank you, Chief or Associate Justice. He, you met us a week ago. You got us into the retiring room and into the uh, Chief Justice Restored uh, Chambers. And my six constituents were just awed by the fact. And they were people, as you have already mm -hmm. identified, that worked with the disability community. They were just thrilled. They were just thrilled. It's a, uh, we, we've talked about it on this program before, and I'm going to get off the topic because then nobody else will have a chance to talk about it while Gene and I visit about it. But it is a, it is a remarkable testament to the skill and talent of uh, uh, the people who worked on that project and to you, the legislators, who approved it because uh, this was not an easy or a cheap project. It's, you know, what, $300 million, I think? Yeah, about 300 million. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, it's uh, and it's a but it is a remarkable restoration and for our viewers who have not had a chance to to visit it we encourage you to to come to your capital and see what it looks like so. absolutely because now the public spaces are public spaces mm -hmm. and the accessibility is everywhere handicap accessibility is like never before and I know Representative Vertel was part of this too so he mm -hmm. was an integral part of this from the beginning we've we've had a chance to discuss this i think every time he's been with us over the last couple of years um, so let's get back to the subject matter at hand representative plowski tell our viewers a little bit about your your background committee you serve on things of that sort i uh social studies teacher. I was a golf professional for about 20 years. I've been in the legislature uh, for 32 years. I now serve on Ways and Means. I'm the lead on higher education and I'm on the Rules Committee. I have a uh, favorite uh, besides the restoration of the Capitol and that is uh, <laughs> reforming Minnesota's legislative process. And We may want to get into that. I think we've had some problems over the last few years and we need to make some changes. Uh, that would be a worthy topic, and we'll see if we can explore that over the course, sometime over the course of the next hour. Also joining us from Mound, District 33, Senator David Osmick. Senator Osmick, tell our viewers a little bit about your background, committees you serve on. And so sure, forth. I'm uh, the chair of the Energy and Utilities Committee of the State Senate. I also serve on transportation, on local government, on capital investment. Uh, serve the good residents of Western Hennepin County and Chanhassen. Uh, professionally, I'm one of the rarities, and actually, I'm the rook, I'm probably the rookie here on the panel. Mm -hmm. I've I've only served for six sessions, so mm -hmm. I've been there at probably the newest. But uh, I'm probably a different type of senator in that I actually maintain my full-time job with uh, through United Health Group as well as working at the Capitol, and it takes a lot of balancing. But uh, I've been able to manage that, and and I think a more of that. I think if some more of our colleagues had that outside influence in the private sector, I think we, we may be even more successful as, as a legislature. But happy to be here and happy to talk about the issues with you. Very good. And finally, um, last but certainly not least, Representative Dean Erdahl. I think, Representative Erdahl, you and I met <coughs> like 35 or 40 years ago, maybe something early 1980s in there somewhere. We were both 10. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> good man. Good man. Tell our viewers a little bit about your background, what you're doing now. Well, I'm a, a native of Litchfield, uh, Minnesota. and. Uh, I was graduated from St. Cloud State, uh, Princeton on the Prairie, I like to call it, <laughs> and uh, became a social studies teacher for uh, 35 years at New London Spicer. Um, for four of those years, I was also in the legislature. I tried to uh, uh, do both for four years and then decided uh, that uh, I should quit teaching and just be a, legislature, uh, a legislator. But then again, I keep teaching when I'm in the legislature, <laughs> at least I try to. But uh, I, I serve uh, the, uh, my, my district, 18A, is uh, Meeker County, the largest city there, Litchfield. I have three townships in McLeod County, including half the city of Hutchinson. And then in Wright County, I have one township, that's Cocado, Cocado Township. Uh, the committees that I serve on, uh, I'm, well, I'm in my eighth term now. Uh, I'm on agriculture finance, uh, education, innovation uh, policy. Uh, I'm on legacy and ways and means, and I chair the Capital Investment Committee, the, the bonding committee. And just one aside, uh, I once climbed to the very top, and I touched the base of the gold ball on top of the Capitol. <laughs> okay, so did I. I've done, I've done that too. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not me. So it's, uh, that, I don't like heights. That's, uh, that's a career goal for you, uh, Senator. I could so, aspire to that. Yeah. I, I was going to uh, ask you, uh, you know, I think when we talked here, if not last year, the year before, you been working. You were working on a book. You've had several published Civil War histories and things like that. Uh, give us give us a 15-second update on your writing career. 
Well, I have uh, nine published books. Four of them deal with the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, and uh, my last uh, couple of books are on the Civil War, uh, Minnesota regiments in the West. Mm -hmm. They're historical fiction, but the history is the way it happened. Uh, my last book came out last August. It's called Remains of Glory, mm -hmm. uh, the story of the last two years of the Civil War in the West, the West being Kentucky, uh, Missouri, Tennessee. All right, very good. We have a, as I said, we have a distinguished panel. There's a lot of talent here. So let's let's talk. Uh, let's move on to the issues. Uh, this is the last last week, the last issue that we had. We only had a chance to discuss it very briefly. It did not go away in the intervening week. That's the Min Lars question and driver's licenses. So let's go right to that, and uh, maybe our panel can update us on what the status of things is. Who wants to take a run at that first? Can we start with you, Senator. Sure. Um, so, uh, just this morning, uh, David and I started mm -hmm. our morning at eight o'clock in a conference committee. That's a joint uh, committee of the House and the Senate, uh, three from each side, to work out the differences in the Min Lars bill. And meaning Senate. that the House had passed one and the Senate had passed yeah, one. Yeah, there were different right. versions, so we right. needed to reconcile the differences. We did that uh, and sent uh, an identical bill then back uh, to the respective, well, first to the Senate, then to the House, and so now it's actually on its way as of, I think, an hour ago or mm -hmm. so to the, to the governor's desk. And so this would be um, um, some provisions that provide um, uh, some a little bit of additional funding to uh, continue with the process of fixing the Minlars uh, system. Um, uh, it you know, had a lot of glitches and errors when it got rolled out uh, last summer, and so they need to uh, continue the process of programming and doing the fixes. But it also establishes a committee a legislative committee housed in the Legislative Coordinating Commission, again comprised of House members and Senate members, um, as an oversight and governance committee that um, will receive from the department's uh, regular updates, uh, performance measures, uh, and some, have some accountability for that. The funding um, that, that will need to occur later this session to fund them through the remainder of this year and into next year, uh, it will come later. Um, but that will be apportioned out on a quarterly basis, um, assuming that they meet these performance standards as determined by this committee. They will have some assistance from the legislative auditor in, in determining whether or not they're meeting the standards. Some of the, the accountability, the legislative auditor oversight, overseen. transparency. Yeah, so that's the, that's, the, that's the plan. Senator Osmond, since you were there this morning, let's ask you what, uh, what your views are on the Minlar's uh, issue and, and the bill that apparently is on its way to the governor. I was very happy that we did not have to go to the general fund. We did find revenue that was that exists with, within dedicated funds within uh, the state government. We didn't have to chase and grab money out of the, the taxpayer's pocket for this because um, this is a failure of not just one branch but all branches. Um, we created a Hindenburg and we watched it blow up. That's really This is a technological equivalent of a Hindenburg. And it didn't have to happen. And the reason I say that is because I come from this type of situation. I work in the technology area. I'm a project manager. I'm also a testing manager. And what was proven over time is that the testing was horribly not performed, as well as the project management wasn't sufficient to be able to detect problems. We could have kept it offline, kept with the old system, but we move forward. That's past. In present, it was important for us to get this done because we need to get that system live and online. The one component that some complaints have been made is that we're not giving money to the, uh, to the departments for people at a call center. And on the floor today, I would explain why it probably isn't prudent for us to do that. Because if you give them the money, the earliest you're going to see it is about April 1st to the departments. Then you have to put post the job positions. Then you have to get the a posting up onto the web. Then you have to wait for time to get posting, get, have applicants come in, then you have to interview them, then you have to wait for them to come to you because they probably have to put in notice at their job, then you have to train them. The earliest time frame to get somebody in, I think, would probably be two or three months before somebody could get to the call center. So I think the best thing to do is get out of the, get the funding out of the way. The call center wasn't, I, in my opinion, wasn't going to be particularly helpful because by the time you got the help, as Min Lars has told us, they are going to be continuing to reduce the number of backlogs and problems over time. And by the time we get to July, it may not necessarily be there for you. The need may not be there. So I'm, and that I also lastly point out, it was a very bipartisan effort. Uh, Senator Dibble worked with Senator, Senator Newman on this. Senator Newman deserves a ton of credit on this. Um, 
We got a bipartisan vote on the floor. There were only 17 no votes against it. Uh, I think in the House there was it was pretty almost a unanimous vote. I'll let our, our House colleagues talk to that. But it was one where we knew we had to step up to the plate and deal with it and not point fingers, and that's what we did. Representative Plusky? No, I, I agree that the, uh, the vote was overwhelming mm. in the House, and we needed to do it. But I think it begs a bigger question. We've had two significant failures here. We've had Minshur and now Minlars. So it begs the question of how these systems are created. And like the senator, my son deals with this full time also. I think we now have to create a system where we contract out to professionals to create these who are responsible for it and who will make sure it works before, before it's turned on. So that has to be, I think, the goal. We can no longer do this in-house. It has to be done in a professional way. And it has to work before the public has access to it. Representative? Well, I, I'd agree with Representative Pulaski a, a little bit in that, you know, we shouldn't have turned it on until we knew that it worked. And uh, I think one of the, the major differences between the House bill and the Senate bill that was uh, both passed today is that uh, in the House we had uh, a provision that uh, the funding, the ten, roughly $10 million, should be taken uh, from the executive branch. And that was a uh, obviously a point of contention uh, with the governor, uh, and uh, eventually with the Senate. Uh, and uh, I think at the end we we realized that it was more important to get this done uh, than to you know, hold this hold firmly onto this, uh, making the governor pay for it. Uh, one one point that uh, I don't think has been brought up yet that I believe is in in the bill, and that is that uh, we are asking for an extension. Uh, an extension on the real ID, mm -hmm. which I know is a big concern for a lot of people, and uh, that extension will be applied for. All right, very good. Well, we've um, we've got questions from viewers who want us to move on to other issues. A viewer from Hampton wants us to talk about what's the future of higher education. A viewer wants everyone knows that tuition and debt are increasing, but what should be our focus? Talks. This viewer talks about vocational training, but also notes that many employers are now requiring a four-year degree for jobs that actually may not require a four-year degree. There are a lot of issues embedded in that question, but let's take generally the question of higher education. Let's start with you, Representative Pulaski, because I know you've had a real interest in that topic. For the past year, I've been monitoring with several other legislators the impact of the 2017 bill. And unfortunately, what's happened is on February 5th, Winona State announced it was making $6.2 million in cuts as a result of the way that bill was structured and partially because the bill did not even remotely anticipate what's happening with declining enrollment. So we're seeing cuts across the Min State system and in some of the other campuses, actually, the cuts will be percentagely larger. For instance, at both Southwest and St. Cloud, we have major problems with uh, both funding and how they're going to move forward once we get into the next biennium. So I agree with the caller that there has to be changes in the way we are funding higher ed. For instance, you can't freeze tuition and not pay for it unless you're addressing declining enrollment. And the technical college thing is interesting because today I introduced a bill which will not be heard this year, but which I anticipate hopefully we'll take a look at next year, is to move the technical colleges out of the Min State system and back into the school districts so that we can have technical education in the K-12 system, which when we created the technical colleges, the unfortunate result was we stripped almost all of the K-12 system of any technical education. It migrated over to the technical colleges and our high schools slowly withered away with hands-on learning. We have an environment now where we desperately need employees. We need trained employees. I don't know why we can't have someone graduate from our high schools with a skill set that they could then go into the workforce. So the bill begins to explore the what we should have done, I think, originally, is keep that technical education in the K-12 system and then make it seamless, and we'll have literally a two-track system. You can go both the liberal arts route, you can go the technical route, and we can share those resources where they exist. In, in high school, you're saying? I'm saying in the high school, we used to have the technical colleges in the grade school systems. I think they need to be merged again 
we have, and then have one layer of administration and make sure that the student, and even if it's in ninth grade, start the hands-on learning early enough so that they can migrate towards something that when they graduate, you can be hired. We all know that the employers want someone who has a skill. Then let's give these students the opportunity to have the skill at the high school level so they can get the job when they graduate. Well, one of our problems, you know, going back years is that uh, our, our high schools are, have started to basically uh, push our graduates to four-year universities. Uh, right now, uh, two-thirds of our graduates are going to four-year universities, but only one-third of our jobs require a four-year degree. And that's certainly a situation we need to address. Uh, I've, I've actually been to Finland, and I've viewed the Finnish model and read about it. And uh, you know, there they, in high school, do what you have been talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. Things in ninth grade, you go one track or the other. And you, I think it's important that there's the flexibility that you can move back between them. I'm not saying to freeze them in a track. No. But what I'm saying is we have the resources available to do this, and I think it addresses another concern. We have declining enrollment both in our K-12 system and in our two-year system, the technical college system. I think this helps address that concern because we would have simultaneously these students moving back and forth. I don't see any reason why we can't do this, and actually the bill says that Minn State should present us with a plan. Well, and the onus on them, I'd like to see this. Instead of doing charter the, charting the future, which is going nowhere, why don't we talk about charting the present so we have a decent future? Well, I also think you need to change the mindset that if you have a college, if you're a kid, if you're in high school, that you, there's, a, there's a mentality that says, if I don't go to college, I'm a failure. And I think we have to change that mindset. My daughter is going to yep. Minneapolis Technical Community College. She loves it. She's going for web design. You don't need a four-year degree for this. So many, the, 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 our, our industries are all mm -hmm. changing. She's so, your constituent. Yes. Yeah. So, well, she doesn't live there. She votes at home. <laughs> she spends her days there. She does. But uh, my other daughter said, as she came up to me, I think it was last year, she was a sophomore. She said, I want to go into auto mechanic. I went, okay, they make a lot of money. And, but you can't, I think there's this mentality you have to break through in the high school system itself, in the school systems itself, that says you're not a failure if you go to a technical college. Matter of fact, you've got a very fulfilling career there. Well, how many so, of us have so, been to events where we've been told there is not a workforce available? We have a potential workforce graduating in every one of our districts. Give them the skill set so they can get the right. job. Senator and, I, and I just want to say, he, he put a lot in that question. He did. He was very, very, <laughs> yeah. very economized his words very well. So I just wanted to touch on one, one point he raised, which is on this issue of requiring four-year degrees for jobs that don't actually need it. That is an issue. I'm not sure exactly how to address it. I don't know that we can dictate to employers exactly what the skill sets they list are, but certainly raising that as a discussion is I've been hearing more about that lately and it's can, a real can, access well, and opportunity. We stay with this one for a second. Sure, absolutely. When I chaired higher ed and we were going out into these different the two at the two and four years what I heard repetitively was it particularly in the two years that students were moving the skill set credits up front and once they got the skill set credits they didn't even get whatever it was, the certificate or the degree, they took the skill set, they took it to the employer, and the employer said, that's exactly what I want, we'll train you in whatever it is, automotive or whatever mm -hmm. uh, other uh, occupation it was. That's the mindset we need. Mm -hmm. We need that type, and the employers, I think, are begging for it now. They, they need the employees. Well, shop courses in our high schools are not well, all what they used to be. They're gone in a lot of areas. Yeah. In my case, Mr. Tverdick asked me to leave shop after ninth grade. <laughs> there are other reasons for that. Well, I went to Glencoe High School, and at Glencoe we had a big FFA presence, but we also had a metal shop, and they had metal. They had equipment that rivaled some companies, which was great because you learn to deal with you know uh, farm equipment, but not just that, but also be able to do metal fabrication. So that's been changed. That doesn't happen anymore. It's been replaced by other priorities that school districts have. All I'll say about my shop career is that if Mr. Thesey is still with us, it turned out okay, even though shop didn't. So we'll, <laughs> we'll let it go. We'll let it go with that. So a viewer from, uh, we're, as long as you're on the education topic, a viewer from Rush City wants to talk about, well, we have a budget surplus. How about more money for special education as well as for support staff like psychologists, counselors, and social workers? So let's uh, let's start with you, um, uh, Representative Verdal. What's your thought on that question? Well, uh, first of all. Unfortunately, our surplus isn't uh, 
of the size that, that we could do that this year. Uh, I think that there are going to be some other priorities. When we go into a budget year, which is again next year, uh, I think there are areas like that we need to take a serious look at. Uh, we are, I believe, 50th in you know, per student counselor ratio in the nation. And especially with the uh, uh, advent of, of some of the, the school violence and, and the situations we've been facing, I, I think that uh, you know, there is a, uh, an increased role for more counselors in our schools. Uh, you know, certainly funding for education uh, is a very important thing for the state of Minnesota. It is the number one item in our state budget. And uh, when we come into a, a budget year next year, I'm sure it will be a, a very uh, high priority again. Senator so the, the governor did just uh, release his uh, supplemental budget. This isn't a, a, a budget year per se, um, but uh, every we set the budget at the beginning of the, of the biennium, which was last year for the coming two-year cycle. But we did come into uh, this session with a 300 and some million dollar surplus. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, much of the surplus occurs on a one-time basis, so it's hard to um, budget for things that have ongoing uh, obligations. We call those tails. Um, but he did come out with a supplemental budget using some of those dollars. Put most of those dollars on the bottom line, about $120 million on the bottom line. Just reserve it for um, our credit rating or some future need. Um, uh, but uh, 100 and some million of that he um, did uh, designate for other purposes, some tax relief, uh, a big portion of that, 70 some million dollars for education, K-12 education, and a good, a good portion of that for what he's calling safe schools initiative. So for counselors, other kinds of support staff, school psychologists, social social workers. And I think about half of that, uh, 30 some million bucks for additional dollars for special ed, which is really, really important. It's a huge impact. Minneapolis Public Schools is facing a $33 million deficit. It's about five point something percent of their overall budget. And all of that can be attributed to um, the fact that Minneapolis Public Schools has to pick up special ed through on the basic per pupil formula or on its own property tax can't go to the reserves anymore there are no reserves left you know they can do a number of other things as well um, you know get rid of some of the central office bureaucracy and the like but uh, Minneapolis Public Schools spends about 118 million dollars on special ed and uh, 85 of that comes from those non special ed sources and we have a, a, a promise that has never been kept to to pick up most of special ed costs through federal contributions and state 40 percent yeah through the feds and 30 percent through through uh, state contributions and I think we're at 18 um, percent uh, supporting special ed purposes and so it's a, it's a big deal so a little bit of money we're grateful for but we need to have a completely different conversation about special ed funding and in the house we, we have been talking about that mm -hmm. and you know certainly the cross subsidy the fact that our school districts are having to pay so much more uh, for it is a, is a big concern uh, and all of the things you're, we're talking about are important, but it, it comes down to you know, what are the priorities? Uh, again, in, in the great scheme of things, 300 million isn't that much money. And you know, we're talking about tax conformity and how all of this matches up. And so uh, you know, it's going to come down to that. You know, wh what are the priorities? What can we do with the money we have? Well, this is a full budget year discussion. So 2019 would be the appropriate place. However, this is also an election year and we are electing a governor. So we're, the House is up and a governor. This would be the type of thing that a governor should take on his initiatives and say it's going to be in his budget and this is going to be part of what's going to be dealt with in 2019. For Greater Minnesota, these are real issues. We desperately need to have counselors. And when you're talking about special ed, with our school districts are stressed to the max. And when you have to assign one-to-one -one ratios, it really strips our staff from other places that they could also be useful. So I would encourage the uh, caller to say, make sure you pick the governor that's going to do this, 2019. Well, the Senate Republican Caucus, uh, the majority, we had made at the very beginning of session, we made two priorities, and they were one and one A, and they both went back and forth. One was school safety. Two was tax conformity. For school safety, uh, we are going to be coming out with a plan that deals, that deals with this in two different ways. Um, of course, it's all in the air. I, I will give credit to Senator Pratt and Senator Nelson for taking the leads on these. Um, one is to increase the, the safe schools levy at the, at the local level so that the locals, if they need it, 
the school board can increase the safe school levy at their discretion, and that levy goes to exactly w uh, many of the issues that the caller has brought in. Uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, physical plant security, um, even rooms or, e or facilities for the mental health providers. So it does not only solve what he this caller is talking about, but also helps with the school safety issue that we have. The other, other component is some one-time cash based on per, pu per, pu per pupil unit. And I'm not on edu any education committee, so I sort of tried to understand everything that happens here. But I think a one-time cash infusion, again, to provide school districts um, additional funding to be able to provide safe schools is something that we as a caucus, uh, as a majority, believe in. We don't believe in going in other directions other than school safety. And if we're going to focus on it, that's what we need to spend the money on. So we have a question from a viewer in Minatrista that wants to talk about uh, uh, gun issues. And this viewer wants to know what, how the panel feels about supporting bills proposed by Senator Latz, uh, expanding background checks uh, to include private sales with exclusion for direct family members, and uh, the um, TRO, TRO uh, bill um, based on request by uh, law enforcement or family members to allow temporary removal of firearms. Um, the viewer indicates that these provisions have been enacted uh, in various places elsewhere and wants to know whether the panel supports them. So who wants to take a run at that first? So, should we start with you, Rep. Rep. Zemplowski? That's the question that would be dealt with by the majority of both the House and the Senate. And I want to remind the viewer that the House has a 77 Republican majority and a 57 DFL minority. The majority will decide if these are taken up, even if they're taken up in committee or if they're taken up on the House floor. So I would encourage the caller to make sure that the majority party is aware of his or her concerns. Well, Representative Erdahl, we'll uh, move to you. What do you think? Well, you know, for, first of all, obviously this is a, a big issue that we are we are concerned about. Uh, the, the school violence, as a, as a former teacher myself, is, is one who... Uh, actually is the author of the lockdown legislation in the state. Uh, I've long been concerned. It comes down to what can we actually do, uh, given the, the realities of, uh, of our dynamics. Uh, we can do two things, I think. First of all, uh, we should be focusing in areas of mental health and in school security. Th those are two areas that I think we can, we can reach uh, broad support within both caucuses uh, in the House and the Senate. Uh, some of the gun issues are much more controversial, much more difficult to pass, and sometimes uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, be pushing those things that in the end you can't do, even if you want to, uh, at the expense of those things that you can get done. And we can do things in mental health, we can do things with school security. Uh, I know that there are various mental health pieces of legislation and bills out there. What I can do as chair of the uh, Capital Investment Committee is to uh, sponsor legislation for uh, $30 million for five mental health crisis centers in the state and also a bill to do uh, training for mental health professionals. Uh, and that's a big need. Our, our, our jails, our emergency rooms are becoming filled with mental health patients, and that's not what they're supposed to be doing. So let's get some mental health crisis centers out there, and uh, they also serve the outpatient capacity uh, and, and do serve adolescents as well. Senator Osner? Well, it's from Minatrista. That's a constituent of mine. So um, I think, well, first off, you have to compartmentalize that we're going to deal with school safety separate from gun issues. Second, it, we have a very short session. This is less, this is a month. We're at first deadlines tomorrow. Um, so uh, Senator Limmer has not only said we're not going to be doing these types of gun bills, we're also not going to do more conservative gun bills. The Castle Doctrine, that's not on the table. It's not going to be hurt. Uh, con constitutional concealed carry or constitutional carry, that's also not going to be heard by the Senate. So. If you think that we're just picking, the Senate Republicans are just picking on one part of the equation, saying, well, we're favoring one side versus the other, we're not. We're not doing in Minnesota, uh, by Senator Limmer's uh, own discussion, we're not taking them up because we don't have enough time to really work the bills correctly and get the issue dealt with. 
Uh, but more importantly, we're treating each site equally. So the response to the viewer's question is that Senator Latz's bill is unlikely to uh, be voted on in the Senate this year? I would say the answer to that is yes, but also all of the other gun bills, including constitutional carry and castle doctrine, which I actually favor, also are not going to be coming to the floor. We do not have the time, nor do I think it honestly would be fair to take, start taking one over the other because uh, it, we need to deal with this more globally. Senator Dibble. So, um I'm just listening to this, uh, trying to uh, imagine myself as a young person listening to this conversation. Um, just a couple of hours before coming here, I was out in uh, Mendota Heights helping send off uh, 70 uh, teenagers to Washington, D.C. for a big march that's going to be occurring. Uh, thousands upon thousands of, of high school aged kids are going to be in D.C. marching on the mall and uh, quite a few are going to be coming over to the state capitol as well on, on Saturday. Um, and I think they would express a great deal of dissatisfaction with this conversation um, because they feel like um, this phenomenon of uh, tragedies in the schools, um, they're at the, at, the, at the wrong end of those guns and uh, they're expressing a great deal of dissatisfaction and impatience um, and feel like uh, uh, they've been thwarted in their request repeatedly uh, to have hearings on what are uh, fairly straightforward uh, matters that it, we've tried to get movement on for a number of years. Um, you know, universal background checks is a good idea. Getting guns out of the hands of people who are dangerous to themselves or, or others is a good idea. These are simple matters that, that uh, have been discussed, researched, uh, vetted. You know, other ideas are to uh, make sure that we're collecting the kind of data and understanding the, the phenomenon and nature of, of gun violence and how to improve gun safety in our in our state and in our country. Um, so uh, I think we can duck these issues for only for so long, but young people are going to settle this matter uh, pretty soon. And so I think we should pay attention and start listening to them because they're building a movement and the dynamics around this are changing dramatically and quickly. All right. Um, we have a viewer from Walker who wants us to talk about chronic wasting disease. And is there anything happening at the legislature on that topic? Uh, that was a subject of an article in the Star Tribune here in the last uh, several days. Who wants to take a run at that? I don't, I don't know about any of the committees. <laughs> I, I, I've heard that it's being discussed in the Environment Committee, but I don't know to what extent it's being discussed. So I assume that if we can address it within the DNR budget, there will be some addressing of it. Because in southeastern Minnesota, we've had incidents that have occurred. And it is penetrating now into areas where uh, it's, it's crossing over into uh, unfortunate um, costs for farmers in particular and then for people who are raising private herds. And that's where my last complaint came from, from a constituent. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we will at least have the ability to have the DNR start taking a look at it. I saw a deer in my district once. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the DNR, you know, it, it does take a very active uh, position in this. And, you know, as a member of the Agriculture Committee, we do from time to time uh, have reports from the DNR about chronic wasting and uh, I know that it has very uh, profound effects on the livestock industry uh, if if that gets if that takes hold so they are very quickly isolated and uh, you know put down I, when when they are discovered to have that disease so we've got another couple questions from viewers, and I'm going to get to those before we're done. But I wanted to go, Representative Plusky, so that we don't run out of time to talk about the topic you raised, which is a more philosophical question, which is the process of improving the legislative uh, machinery, so to speak. Uh, and so I want to give you a minute or so, a minute or two, All to right. talk about that, and then we'll see what your colleagues think of your ideas. So today we have hit 4,210 bills introduced into the Minnesota House. 4,210 for a 120-day session over two years with 134 legislators. I'm going to repeat that. For 120 days over two years, 134 legislators were at 4,210 bills. You cannot put an infinite number of resources into a finite system and expect anything other than a breakdown. Over the last 20 years, we've had 16 special sessions, including last year's, where both the governor and the legislature managed to soil itself by attacking each other, the resolution of which we had to have the first week of this session. So when I chaired government operations, 
I had eight hearings. I opened it up to the entire House, and we made a series of recommendations. Those recommendations you can see online. They're still on my website. At least one of them was adopted, and I think it, it's still used, and it's used well because nobody can say we shouldn't use it, and that is when a bill comes to the House floor, you have to post your amendment 24 hours in advance so everybody in the state can take a look at it and see what the amendment does. There were other recommendations. Now, I know this is not going to sit well with some people, but there are states that say you get only six bills for the course of a session. Well, six times 134 is still a lot of bills. By the way, I have five. <laughs> the, the ones I really like are the drop-dead deadlines. So at some point, no more introduction of bills. We just work with what we have. Let's say it's 3,000. I think that's a lot. I think we can you know, manage to do what we need to do with 3,000 over 120 days, or whatever it might be. We have Keep in mind a very small percentage ever winds up passing of well, the 3,000. Well, you and I both know how many of these things pass. Yeah. And it's 5% <coughs> or less, maybe, that we have dropped dead deadlines both for policy and finance committees, and that we establish targets early. So, for instance, for capital investment. I think we, he, he should have a target right now, and we should be working on what's in that target right now so we understand what's in it, and not like what happened in 2016 when we went to the House floor with a bill that had been concocted in the last two hours, and then... And I was not chairman. No, you were not. No, you were not. But when the amendment, which was four lines long, to make that bill work, four lines, and now we have 20 minutes left in session, and there were only two errors. There was a decimal place missing in one line and a zero in the other. So it was only $821.9 million off. We passed it, it went to the Senate, and it died because of lack of time. That should have had at least a week for everybody to take a look at what the bill was, how it worked, and that should never. Plus, it had 30 major errors and 29 minor errors. And I'll give you an example of a major error. Duluth had a project for $26 million. It was on the spreadsheet. It wasn't in the bill. We don't pass spreadsheets. We pass bills. Duluth was very upset, and rightfully so. So, time. Take your time. Make sure the public has input. Make sure everybody understands what you're voting on before you vote on it. And again, if, if I think we could possibly hit 5,000 bills this session. So my, just to be devil's advocate here, uh, Representative Pulowski, I've been doing this program now 27, 28 years. I'd have to do the math. That's another one of those things I wasn't great at in school. <laughs> but um, I think uh, in most years, certainly in most full years, the problem that you're identifying, regardless of which party's in control, regardless of which yeah. governor is, is, in, the, is uh, in the governor's mansion, um, we seem to have this problem. And so the question is, can you make structural reforms to deal with this, or, or is it just simply a function of the legislative process and there's just no way to fix it? I think when I chaired GovOps, that's the first extensive series of hearings we ever had on legislative process, and it was bipartisan. The recommendations were bipartisan. The fact is, and I'm going to repeat it, 16 special sessions in 20 years, there is nothing special about a special session. Go to the last special session. It's because of that special session that something had to go to your court to be decided whether or not the governor could veto legislative budgets. This all came out of that special session. We don't need a special session. We need to complete our work during session. We need to make sure everybody understands what we're going to do. And frankly, we don't need to be cute about putting things in, whether it's the Department of Revenue or whether it's the governor line item vetoing budgets. That should never be an issue that's before us. What's before us, what's good for the people of Minnesota, making sure this budget works and those resources go where they need to go. So let's, uh, our senior, uh, other senior members, on the House side, what do you think about all of this process reform? Well, I, I think Representative Pulowski has a lot of a lot of good ideas that, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I wish that we could just snap our fingers and they would all work. Uh, you know, I taught how the process worked for a long time, and then I get into the legislature and find that it doesn't always work the way I taught it, <laughs> uh, and especially uh, when you get into capital investment. Uh, and there are all kinds of reasons why it doesn't 
quite work the way it's supposed to, uh, where you know one house, the house passes, the senate passes, you go to conference committee, and then the governor signs, and you have a law, and it just for a lot of different reasons doesn't always work that way, especially in capital investment. Um, and part of the problem, frankly, is trust. Uh, I think uh, in a lot of ways we are we are suffering from a, uh, a deficit in the trust level. Uh, and uh, there are other other factors involved as well. And then there's, uh, you know, you, you try to put the bill together and you think you've got it. You think you're putting the bow on it at the end and then you get in that room and someone goes, oh, just one more thing. And it, it's, uh, it's not the best way to put things together. Senator Dibble. But, but I will say this. We came out with a very good bill last time for as bad as things were putting it together. At times, the bill was very good. Senator Dibble? Um, well, uh, you know, I, so I've been around a while now myself, and, um, you know, there's always been politics and always, uh, you know, leaders kind of cutting deals in the, in the, you know, the back hall or the back room, and, you know, that's, that's been true since time immemorial. But uh, I've never seen uh, as bad a process as I've seen in the last couple of years. Uh, Representative Pulaski is absolutely right. Um, these... And, and it's happening in Congress too. These, you know, many hundreds of pages long bills just appear on our desks in the final hours of session. Uh, no one has seen or read, and and we're asked to vote on these. It is, it is unconscionable. It is it is shocking and and totally unacceptable. Um, and uh, so I strongly support uh, Representative Plowski's uh, arguments for early deadlines. Uh, Budget targets established early, so we know what we're working towards. Uh, making sure that the bills are out and and in a readable format, so that the public uh, can be informed. So those who know something about something can inform us about what it is that's in those proposals, um, so that we can we can consider them in the full light of day with good information. I mean, and I, I mean, I just can't even believe uh, what we've been forced to vote on in the last couple of years. And, and I just want to I just want to say uh, to push back a little bit on that in terms of the unprecedented nature, uh, again, reflecting on my time here, and actually I think this might even precede my time here, uh, Representative Pulaski, uh, you talked earlier about vocational schools. The combination of the vocational schools and the community colleges, that little experiment, whether it's been successful or not, as I recall, was an end-of-session uh, event sponsored by the then Senate, Senate Majority Leader, Roger Mull. Well, he actually, what he did was combine all of the two years with the four years into one system called Minsku, which I voted against repetitively until the governor said, well, you're going to do it or you're, you're not going to get a bill. And it has taken three small systems that were highly focused into one behemoth that is now in downtown St. Paul. It's the third largest campus in the Min State system, and it doesn't have a student. So you'll notice I'm on another bill with Representative Knobloch to say, let's take all the administration, divide it up, put it on the campuses, and then the campuses can support the administration and the administration can support the campuses. But I want to repeat the last one. The administration is there to support the campuses. And, and my point would be that that was a last-minute legislative session. It was right. by a certain senator who is now, I believe, a trustee of the Minn State system. And, you know, but, just to be clear, a lot of the points you're making, uh, I don't disagree with. You know that those should be things that we aim toward doing. But another thought that uh, a bill actually that uh, Representative Knobloch has is to go back to a nonpartisan legislature. You know, that would be an, an interesting take on the future too. Well, so when Senator Osmock, I, I want to invite you to the party. It's, uh, I didn't want to bring in the rookie. <laughs> so I've lived through a unilateral DFL control. I've lived through split government where the House and Senate were in two different parties. Now I've lived with Republicans in both chambers having the majorities. And I don't necessarily say that it's just the last couple of years. When I was in the minority, uh, we would get bills the last the last hour of session, and uh, you have, you're expected to read through that much paper. Well, of course that's not going to happen. You do rely upon the leads of your committees to know what's in, what's out, to that that you know what's in the in the bill itself. But it isn't necessarily this. This is not something that's just happened in the last couple of years. And to uh, Representative Erdahl's point, there is something that I call the Colombo syndrome, that you get done with a bill and then they go. But one more question, like old 
you know, Detective Columbo, there's always one last thing that they want to put into it. So we've got to avoid that. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the one thing, the, the only way you can reduce the amount of legislation that's going on would be to reduce the number of legislators that are doing it because, you know, you ha your, my House colleagues have a House colleague that put in a bill to ban somebody from the state of Minnesota because he didn't go out with a girl. It was the darndest thing I've ever seen, and it shouldn't have been submitted as a bill, but he did. So you can't stop people. It's a, it's, as a, leg it's a legislative First Amendment that you can put any stupid bill you want up, but I think people have to be a bit more judicious about the silliness that they get into. But I, but I agree, but if you had a limited number <coughs> of bills, I doubt whether that would be one of them. I would hope If not. you said you had six bills and that's it, and by the way, I think this has a corollary effect, it would mean certain lobbyists would have to pick and choose legislature, legislators very carefully if they wanted to get a bill in. You can go to almost anybody and they'll throw <coughs> it in. We have members who put in over 100 bills. I, I can't remember a hundred bills, but I can remember my five very easily. So, so let me ask, just, let's just take that one piece. Let me just ask, just go around the table. Is there some prospect that that particular reform, limiting the number of bills that a legislator can, can introduce, is there some prospect that that might, they would have to go through the House Rules, House, House and Senate Rules These would be rules. Now, and this right. is the other interesting thing, because when we started doing these reforms, I had members come up and say, well, but I want to be on the bill. And you go, no, these are the rules. We have to police ourselves. And that's, see, I'm a golfer. I'm used to policing myself. <laughs> I don't have any problem calling a penalty on me. But we have to police ourselves legislatively, too. And it would have to be in both House and Senate rules, and there would have to be adjustments to joint rules. But do so, you get a mulligan? No. <laughs> no, no more. No. You get six and that's no, it. You, what do you, you, what do you play think, the Senator? ball as it lies. So I, I think it would have to be part of the rules of the body itself. I don't think you could possibly legislate it or constitutionally make it work because you're going to go. You, we, you would run afoul of, the, of a group called the Supreme Court probably at mm -hmm. some point in time. Uh, I just, I, I like the idea, but I think we'd have to self-impose it. And I think it, there's merit to saying you can only have six or ten bills uh, in the Senate. We'd probably want a few more, if you know what I mean. And, and the other issue is those bills would have a higher likelihood of being heard. This is true. And, and that's the other side of it. That you, I think there would be more productivity with the bills we'd be putting in. Senator Dibble, what do you think? What do you I, I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't think there's anything magic about limiting the number of bills. Um, and I frankly think it thwarts, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of the representatives of the people and it thwarts, uh, you know, regular people's access to the process. And, and I wouldn't want to hamper that. Um, but I, but I do agree strongly that uh, we have to be self-policing. I've seen a lot of just doing things because we can, uh, and and not limiting uh, ourselves. You know, big issue um, that I uh, talk about a lot is earmarking uh, roadway projects. For example, we haven't done that. You know, maybe a little bit here and there around the edges, but. You know, we had this long list of 24, 28, 50, I don't know, roadway projects, and that's how the highway user funds were all going to be. And, and we had no idea. That's just a political list, and it had nothing, no bearing on, on reality. Yet um, suddenly the dam broke, and, you know, years of, of, of transportation chairs not doing that, not allowing that, just it crumbled this last year. So there's a lot of that, and, and I completely disagree. You know, maybe the Minsky system, that was one bad idea that came in in the last minute. Um, but uh, and some of these bills uh, might have been rushed through these large omnibus <coughs> bills, but mixing policy with finance, not knowing what the targets are, not having open conference committees to, to at least at least show what's in the bill before it comes to the to the floor. That's just not happening. These bills are, are coming out of a back room, fully formed, budget, policy, all mixed together, uh, actually violating the single subject rule in the state constitution. Uh, and, and just a mess and literally unread, full of errors, um, uh, showing up on our desks in the final minutes of session. I think those, these are things that we absolutely have to forbid in our process. Last, last word to you. I think, I think self-discipline, of course, is very important. Uh, I, I have, uh, I think, about 40 bills that I've chief authored, but I'm, I'm chair of a, of a major committee, and I must have turned down. 40 to 50 more that they came to me asking me to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in a larger sense, I, I just think, you know, having having discipline, and, and a lot of the bills, though, 
Yes, there are some that hit us at the end, but there, there are a lot of ones that we, we see as we go through the process as well. Uh, we just had a, uh, uh, an omnibus bill uh, education uh, innovation session just came from there, and, uh, and we went through a bill and you know, did it the way we're supposed to do it and judiciously, and I think we have a pretty good bill uh, with civics education in there. Oh, well. <laughs> there you go. So, so let me just, we only have a couple minutes left. You, uh, capital investment's an area of, that you're involved with. Can you talk a little bit about bonding and so forth? Uh, what, what size bonding bill are we looking at? Anything in particular you should highlight for us, and then we'll go around the table. That'll be our last question. Well, I, I think... Uh, you know, last year, as I said before, we did, I thought, a very good bill at $987 million. Uh, this year, uh, I'm expecting uh, we're going to be in the $800 million range, uh, and it's, it's a hard one to put together uh, because we are, from my standpoint, point going to be very uh, uh, focused on infrastructure, uh, HEPR for our colleges, universities, uh, PFA, the the public infrastructure, water, wastewater, um, th those types of projects. So a lot, a lot of asset preservation, uh, water projects, uh, local roads and bridges. Uh, and when you start adding those up, when, you, when you're looking at 800 million something, it adds up pretty quickly. Senator Dibble, very quickly, your thoughts, bonding? Uh, bonding, um, well, I, you know, I, I definitely hope we put a lot of dollars into fixing what we have. Um, Heeper is fixing the HVAC systems and the basic, you know, just fixing up our buildings. We own 6,200 6, buildings is right. what we own. Right, yeah, and, uh, and you know, they, they deteriorate and they have to be fixed, and uh, we're kind of getting behind in this opportunity to save a lot of energy. Um, you know, this, uh, our, there's an artificial kind of psychological cap at a, at a billion dollars for bonding. We can go up, above that very, very easily. We can afford that. It won't affect our credit rating. Our population size of our economy has grown to such that we can easily support uh, well over a billion dollars in a as of put, putting people to work immediately and uh, and also invest. But I, I just want to touch on this whole, I don't know if you talked about elder care. We're, we're, we're out of time. All right. We're out of time. So, and unfortunately, we're not going to hear what our last two speakers have to say about uh, the bonding bill. We're going to, we're, but we are going to invite you all back next week because we'll be, have a chance to talk about it then, I'm sure. They were so, going to agree with me. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. But anyway, regardless. I want to thank our guests, I want to thank our viewers, and I want to invite all of you to return next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home for your legislators. Thank you, and good night. Watch more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, a highly sustainable shareholder-driven cooperative that safely produces, processes, and markets sugar while being environmental stewards to ensure future opportunities for its shareholders, employees, and surrounding communities. Additional support by MAPE members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans' care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. And by Ask Me Council 5, a union of 43,000 members who advocate for excellence in public services, dignity in the workplace, and opportunity and prosperity for all working families. <laughs>